The Career Service Review Office, or CSRO, was created to administer the formal procedures to process employee grievances in the merit system. It used to be called the Career Service Review Board, but the board was eliminated from the process when the number of steps for grievances went from six to four. Another change that was made at the same time by the legislature was a reduction in the number of items over which the CSRO may take jurisdiction. The law is written such that the agency head is the final authority for all matters except those which the CSRO has been granted specific jurisdiction for in the law. Also, decisions made by the hearing officers at the CSRO are public record. Thus, any matters that may have enjoyed some level of confidentiality within the agency become publicly accessible when brought to the CSRO. I said earlier that the law tells the CSRO what it can take jurisdiction over. Here's the list. It's not surprising that the most severe disciplinary actions appear here, along with two other ways that employees can lose their jobs, reductions in force and abandonment of position. Wage grievances can only be heard by the CSRO if the employee is not paid within the salary range for their current position. Violations of the Utah State Personnel Act and Benefits Administration may also be heard at the CSRO under certain circumstances. Harassment and discrimination claims cannot be heard by the CSRO because there are other administrative bodies that fulfill those functions for all employers, the Utah Anti-Discrimination and Labor Division and the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. For all other matters, the agency head is the final authority and the decision cannot be appealed further. So let's talk about the steps. If an employee wishes to submit a grievance, the first step is to submit the grievance in writing to their supervisor. No particular form is required, although the CSRO maintains one on their website at csro.utah.gov. When you receive a grievance from an employee, you need to contact HR and your own supervisors immediately. Often, HR is aware of issues brewing or is already handling the same type of grievance from other employees you do not supervise. Just like with disciplinary actions, HR will consult with you to find a solution that works and will withstand scrutiny later. You have five days from your receipt of the grievance to respond to the employee in writing. The day you receive it does not count, but the next five business days are your window. If you do not respond, the employee can forward the grievance to the next level as long as they do so within 10 days of the end of your 5-day response window. I strongly recommend that you respond to every grievance. Not responding and just letting the employee go to the next level strongly suggests that you don't really care. That's not the message you want to send to the employee. Once you respond, if the employee disagrees or is otherwise unsatisfied with your response, they have those same 10 days from the time they received your response to proceed to the next level. Many supervisors have asked me what to do when they receive a grievance for pay, a pay increase or something else that they cannot control. This happens frequently. In these cases, your HR field office will help you formulate a response that courteously acknowledges their grievance, explains that you cannot do anything about it, and tells them how to proceed if they wish to pursue the matter. It would be inefficient to try to cover all the different kinds of grievances you might receive here. Let it suffice to say that you need to work with your HR field office to make sure it is handled correctly from both strategic and procedural standpoints. One other note before we move on to step two. Although the procedures of a grievance may seem adversarial, the interactions you have with the employee about grievances need not be confrontational. Often, employees will submit grievances about the way a particular policy affects them and ask the policy to be changed. If the supervisor responds with a message of, tough luck, deal with it or leave, they miss a chance to develop the employee and their relationship with the employee. When a supervisor takes the time to sit down with that employee, perhaps with HR or other relevant parties to the discussion, and explain to the employee the full purpose of the policy in question and how the benefits of the policy justify the few drawbacks, the employee will feel better about being heard and will still respect the supervisor as such in the aftermath, whether or not they agree with the explanation. Step 2 is very similar to Step 1, except in who receives and responds to the grievance. Instead of going to the supervisor, the Step 2 grievance goes to the division director. The division director will be in touch with HR and issue a response within five days just like the direct supervisor. And, just as before, if the employee is dissatisfied, they have ten days from the close of the five-day period or receipt of response, whichever was first, to forward their grievance to the next level. Some of you may be wondering 
what about all the levels of management between the direct supervisor and the division director? Do they get to participate in this process? The answer is yes, they do. They just don't get to sign any documents. Think of this. A supervisor receives a grievance from an employee and answers it either without consulting his own supervisors or answers it differently than his supervisors had suggested. What will the division director do with the grievance at the next level? Will they uphold the supervisor's response, even if they disagree, so as not to hang the supervisor out to dry? Or do they answer the grievance the way they think it should and let the supervisor's image be damaged? Believe me, your di division director will not appreciate being put in that position. So any time a grievance is received, the direct supervisor should discuss the matter with their supervisors to ensure that the response comes from the agency. Then, if the employee goes to the division director, the response will affirm the supervisor's answer and authority without question. If you are one of those managers in the middle who doesn't get to sign, don't feel too badly about it. You're far less likely than those who sign the documents to have to appear at a CSRO hearing and be questioned as a witness. Step 3 looks a lot like the first two, except that the grievance is received and answered by the agency head or designee, and they have 10 days to respond instead of 5. Otherwise, everything is the same. Also, remember that this will be the final decision for all matters except those listed a few slides back over which the CSRO may take jurisdiction. Step 4 is the only step that operates outside the agency. The employee submits their written grievance to the CSRO directly. The first thing the administrator of the CSRO is going to do is determine whether the CSRO has jurisdiction. In order to hear the case, the matter must be on the list we previously reviewed, it must be timely, within 10 days of the Step 3 answer or 20 days for a dismissal, and the grievant must be a career service employee. If any of these three criteria are missing, the administrator will dismiss the grievance. If all three are present, the administrator will assign the case to a hearing officer who must schedule a hearing no more than 150 days after the CSRO took jurisdiction of the case. At the hearing, the hearing officer will take documents into the record and listen to legal arguments and witness testimony from both sides. After the hearing, the hearing officer will issue a decision which is appealable only to the district court. As you can see, the process is not all that complicated. The trick to dealing with grievances effectively is to make sure you have all of the relevant information, operate within the timelines, and make sure the employee knows that you understand where they are coming from, even if you don't give them what they're asking for. That understanding will go a long way to solving the problem and maintaining a positive relationship after the grievance. Disciplinary appeals are grievances too. However, they are going to start at least one level higher because the notice of intent, the employee's opportunity to respond, and the supervisor's written decision in the notice imposing discipline fulfills all the procedural requirements of Step 1. Thus, discipline administered by any supervisor who is not a division director or above will first be appealed to the division director. If the division director imposed the discipline, the first level of appeal would go to the executive or agency head level. Obviously, for decisions made by the agency head, like demotion or dismissal, there is no internal appeal available, and the first level of appeal will be under Step 4 procedures at the Career Service Review Office. As you can see, the CSRO process is not complicated in form but in application it can be very nuanced. Your HR field office is there to help you with this process. When a grievance or disciplinary problem comes up, you should seek to solve the problem for the agency. You shouldn't worry about what will happen with it at the CSRO. Your HR rep will do that, and by working together with them, you will come to a solution that meets the real-world demand in your agency right now and will withstand a challenge at the CSRO if it comes.